All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. Knicks and Hawks tied at one apiece. And joining me on today's episode to talk about this series needs no introduction, but he's a diehard Knicks fan, a native New Yorker, actor extraordinaire, uh, scout of Knicks gaming as well. Jerry Ferrara. Jerry, how you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm doing great. That was a heck of an intro. You even got the 2K in there, man. Hey, that's the, the last champion. That's the last championship. Hey, I, I should have brought ring, my championship man. ring on the show today. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to talk to you. It took a lot to get this set up, but we're here. Yeah. And uh, what a time, man. What a time. What a time, man. Once again, thanks again for your patience, man. Um, we talked a little bit before and after game two. Uh, give me that play-by-play. -play. You know, Nick's coming into the second half, down 13. Seems like a funeral. I was in the garden. You know, seemed like the same old, same old from game one. What's going in and going on in your house as things are unfolding and we're making a comeback? You know, before before the game, you know, I, I had done a few pods and stuff like that and talked to a few people. I just really thought I had it figured out. I thought the Knicks would sell out on the pick and roll. I really I didn't think they'd stop Trey, but I thought they'd slow him down. I thought Capella would have a huge night. I figured like, oh, it's going to be free slips and rolls to Capella and they're just going to have to hit those and let him beat us. I mean, Capella had like four points. I was way off. Um, and I didn't think Randall, I was like, there's no way Randall stays in this slump. And, um, and he did. And I was pretty upset uh, basically throughout the whole first half, but I still felt like there was a lot of adjustments that could be made. I did. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were only down 12 or 10 or whatever it was at halftime to me, I was very optimistic. And even on, if you look back at my tweets, when everybody was, a lot of people were, you know, I'm not saying they were jumping yeah. off, but they were doing their, like, oh, they're so, like, they were just flipping out. I'm like, listen, we've won games like this all year. We've had these games where it's been a slow start, and then mm -hmm. we get going, and it becomes pretty unstoppable, and then that's what happened. But I did love the adjustments that Tibbs made. I thought he, uh, you know, putting Reggie Bullock on Trey Young, obviously Trey still got his, but that was a huge momentum swing. Yeah, And I know Bogdanovich did not shoot well for his standards, but I yeah. thought he shot a little cr too well in game one. He was hitting contested yeah. threes. Yeah. You just got to say, hey, that's a great shot. He wasn't hitting the contested threes. I think if you leave him open, yeah. he's always going to hit. So he came back down the reality a little bit more. And um, it was kind of like the same game from game one, but inverted. We kind of held on for three quarters and just looked like we were in control. And so were the Hawks. I don't yeah. expect Trey young to sit for a majority of the fourth quarter right. uh, tonight. Yeah, man. It, it just being in the building uh, game one and game two, uh, first off the, the electricity in game two was almost greater than one. If you could even top that, it was just incredible. But then once we got off to that slow start again and Randall, you know, was off and then you could tell there was some miscommunication between Randall and Tibbs because I was, pretty much right behind the Nick bench. It just seemed like it was going to be more of the same, man. I was not optimistic going into that second half, but as you said, the adjustments were huge. You know, the starting lineup adjustments, putting in Derrick Rose and Todd Gibson right away, you know, so that we could actually play five on five offensively instead of going three on five with Peyton and Noel being very limited. You know, I thought that was huge. Uh, the pick and roll between Randall and Rose to me has been potent because now you have a guy that can get Julius shots in rhythm instead of Julius having to create, you know, a la Carmelo and do the step backs. And, you know, with the Hawks having shading him with Capella, it was very difficult for him to drive. But having D. Rose in there with the pick and roll, somebody else that can force the issue, force the defense to collapse, and then you can move the ball around, I thought that was huge. And then Julius' adjustments as well. I thought he was reading the defense a lot better. He started to drive and kick a lot better. Got Bullock going. You know, their chemistry has been pretty good all year. So... Once Julius got going, Bullock got going, it was just great to see, man. And Taj, man, Taj, what he brings, you know, he and Noel bring a different dynamic. Um, obviously, Noel is more on the rim protection side, but Taj offensively just making smart plays, you know, making screens, getting the, the, the making the right pass. Um, I saw a couple of plays where, you know, he would seal off Capella from Randall. So, so allowing Randall or, or Derek Rose to drive as well. I thought Taj was just being a savvy vet. And then closing with Bullock on Trey, you know, shading him to his left, trapping the pick and rolls, getting the ball out of his hand and making the other guys beat us. I thought the adjustments by Tibbs was incredible that second half. So many things off. And by the way, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I'm going to even take it a few steps further. Uh, 
the the thing that Randall did in game two that he didn't necessarily do in game one was while still shooting bad, he was still impacting the game. He right. was a demon on the boards, okay, yeah. which we need help. Capella always kills us on the boards and not having Mitchell Robinson this series. Mitchell Robinson would have been the perfect antidote to all of what the Hawks do, mm-hmm. to the pick mm-hmm. and roll, to the tray floater, to the Capella Everything. offensive boards and rim runs, yeah. and we don't have that. I thought Randall, from even though he wasn't hitting in the first half, I thought he was fantastic on the boards. And then yeah. in the second half, even when he's still a little shaky on offense, his defense was great. Defense and was good. And they even went yeah. small for a minute where they pulled both Taj and Noel. Noel's battling some five. injury stuff. I was even saying on Twitter, like, you know what? This isn't what – go small. Fuck it. Yeah. I was, yeah. Sorry, excuse my language. Oh, sorry. I was going through lineups with all my friends on text, right? Um, at mm. one point, I was saying, okay, what if we go crunch time if it's Rose, Quickly, RJ, Burks – Randall at yeah. center, yeah. you know, I had a, or I had an OB lineup. I was trying to come up with all these small ball lineups. So I thought Randall did a good job of impacting the game, even though he wasn't, you know, getting his 25, uh, yeah. the Rose adjustment, like, yeah, of course he had to do it. And this is no disrespect to Alfred Payton. I've actually been an Alfred Payton defender for mm. most of the year. I've understood the point of what he's, doing what Tibbs is doing like he sets mm-hmm. the table plays good defense gets everybody in their rhythm it's almost like he's like a starter who yeah. then like gets the rest of the game off but the Hawks are wise to this Nate McMillan's a defensive dude and it just shrinks the floor too much too I'm much. not saying don't ever play Alfred Payton again just this series with how long the Hawks are now that Hunter's back in the in the mix yeah it just shrinks stuff down I, I was saying look if you have enough confidence to play Frank the last play of the game with no, ice cold off the bench, yeah, then give him those eight minutes to exactly. get a little bit of rhythm. He's a better shooter than Peyton, and just let Randall or RJ handle the ball for those till Rose comes in. Anyway, he made the right adjustment by putting Rose in, obviously. And I guess I'll ask you because now I'm just trying to figure out: Does he stick with the what he did? Because I mean, can D Rose yeah. really play these 38, 39 minutes a game? <sighs> We need him to, but like to. that's a lot to ask of any player yeah. over the age of 30, let alone D Rose, but he's, he's doing it. He looks super in shape. I just felt like, and you're right, because to me, Hunter was really, he really changed the whole dynamic of the Hawks defense because he only played in the first game of that three game season series that's in right. the regular season. So that's we really right. didn't get to see him. Um, but coming in with that reputation at a UVA, you know, as a, as a three and D player, I knew he was going to give us fits. And so that in game one, that opening lineup, they had Collins on Peyton and Hunter going up against Randall one-on-one with Capella shading him. So when that slowed down the half court, we really had no type of flow, no type of engine for the offense. And that's why I think D Rose is so critical. Yes. You know, but now even in game two, Tibbs, he subbed him in from eight minutes to go in the first all the way through the end of the half, then started him in the third quarter. I'm like, what is going on? So it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot, and I, yeah, I don't know. Is it? Do you just start Rose and then say quickly he's coming ba- backing yeah. him up, or do you stick with what you got and do you give maybe Frank or even like Burks? Like I'm not I'm saying start him at PG, but yeah. But then again, that second unit, the Rose quickly Burks yeah. combo with no Randall on the floor is so yeah. potent. Are you messing with that? This is a really interesting chess move it that is. we have to make. It is. Here. It's potent, but we saw in game two. When Burks quickly and Obi that unit, they went on a nice run in the third quarter. Yo, Obi had the garden electric when he had the block on one and comes back and catches the alley oop from uh, from Alec Burks. The Obi top and chance going off at MSG, man. What a moment for Obi, man. I'm Crazy. sure you heard the MSG call of that, right? Because I was watching yeah. on TNT, but then I saw on Twitter like Mike Breen and Clyde Frazier are losing their minds. So I found that. And, uh, I'm so I, I literally I'm happy for Mike Breen and for Clyde Frazier that they yeah. get to call the you know call some of these games in this atmosphere with the combination of you know people coming back to the garden it's now it's like a reunion you know yeah. i've been in the garden a lot i have obviously i don't think i'm gonna get to a playoff game i don't know if these kids will let me just yet but yeah. it also feels like if you're a nick fan and been going to games wherever you sit in the garden i don't care like this isn't a front row celebrity row thing yeah. i don't care there's regulars all over the garden it's like a yeah. family reunion and you just happen to be gathering at an amazing basketball game yeah that's so, what it felt uh, like, man. The first yeah. two games, that's what it felt like. The electricity, it was unlike anything I had ever experienced at Madison Square Garden. And then 
to come from behind, win game two, spilt out onto 7th Avenue. I mean, did you see? I saw the video. I saw, man. Like, listen, and also you and the stuff you do and, <laughs> you know, and Nick content creators alike, like this is the fact that you guys have been able to make the content that you have when yeah. things have been rough. Now that things are trending upward, like now sky's the limit. You guys, yeah. guys just keep going full blast. You yeah, know, man. I'm telling you, man, we went through nine months of the pandemic, no basketball. We were able to survive that. We brought on a lot of former players and that was great because the right. storytelling, you know, the storytelling of yesteryear was, was great, especially Xavier McDaniel. He was a fan. Oh, the X-Man is yeah. the best. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it meant a lot because we would get uh, tons of messages from fans. Like, you know, you guys really got us through the pandemic. I was going through a hard time. I was depressed. And so yeah. um, it was great. You know, it was great to provide that value. And then for them to come in now, unexpectedly making the playoffs a fourth seed. You know, I had this team winning 26 games this season. I had no idea that because to me, this was Fisdale's team. And I had no clue that they were going to make this big of a leap defensively and even offensively, they turned it around. Obviously, D. Rose being uh, the game changer that he was. So, you know, this season all the way around has been magical, man. House yeah. money is what I call it. Everyone's kind of, now you could officially say, Everyone has done their part because you look at the front off, you look at Scott Perry, you look yeah. at Leon Rose, you look at what you know, Wes, and like all those move the Rose move, the getting Taj back, you know, yeah. the Burks, the Burks signing looks like one of the best sign of free agent signings that wasn't obviously yeah. like, and that was the first day, game. there was the first, first day, day. <laughs> so they, yeah. they did their thing, and then obviously, you look at guys like Grant because it is a tricky thing, right? You're a young guy in the NBA, right? Mm -hmm. Pandemic happens. You're on the Knicks. Your season's over, right? And you have as long of a layoff as you ever have. And there's, it's not easy to get gym time. Yeah. You, you, everyone's scared and justifiably so of like, how do I work out with people? And then guys like Randall, RJ, and whoever like found ways to get in the best shape of their life and improve yeah. their game. So you got to take your hat off to them for doing that. And, um, yeah, man. I, I do give props to Fizdale though, for something, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I went to a lot of those Fizdale games and it just mm -hmm. didn't work and it didn't work with Hornacek. You can't blame all the coaching. Mm -hmm. It's a comp, like all those things I said that have gone well, the opposite was happening from front office and coaching and players, but Fizdale recognized early and no one really did this with Julius Randall, but yeah. Julius Randall was playing point forward yep. under Fizdale. The issue I always had, and this is what I used to always say to my boys I would go to the game with, is like, I like Randall as a playmaker, but I don't like him bringing the ball up Me from neither. the inbound. Me neither. Right? And then making a play. And so I just always thought that that's too much pressure. Get him the ball, you know. And Tibbs has made the adjustment, or whoever has made the adjustment now where, you know, and that's what Peyton really does is he brings the ball up and he gets it to Randall in his spot. Mm -hmm. And Randall's been great all year decision-making. So, But I do remember Fizz was – all about Randall playing point forward. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent, man. Fizz wanted to stretch him beyond, you know, his core competency, his core abilities. And he really did. And he gave him that responsibility. I just felt like it just wasn't in the right scenarios. Right. And he didn't necessarily hold him accountable for that. And so he had a lot of turnovers, the spin moves into the triple teams. And it was a nightmare scenario, man. So yep. Tibbs has definitely reined him in and, and it's paid off dividends, tremendous dividends. Um, Let's talk game two adjustments, right? We started with the starting lineup just to pick that back up. I'm going Rose first, and then I'm, I'm going quickly Burks, and then I'm sliding Frank into that wing rotation for Bullock, for RJ, maybe for quickly at points because I want him on Trey at times, Lou Will, Herder. I mean, the Hawks have so much uh, firepower on the perimeter, man, that we they have do. to get Frank some minutes in there. I just slide him into the wing rotation that way. But I'm starting with D-Rose right off the bat. And then I'll go to Burks a little bit earlier to give him a spell. So I'm going to, I'm going to lean a little bit different. Okay. I, and um, only because I just, I don't want to break up the, that trifecta off yeah. the bench, but also, you know, I do want to be able to have that ability to go to D Rose in the third and play him all the way. So I'm going to, I'm going to bench Peyton and I'm going to put Frank in. I would put Frank in the start. Again, mm -hmm. this is for like six minutes. And Randall's and RJ are going to be running the offense. And yeah. Frank then slides. In, and he's a good corner three shooter. Yeah. So at least you get, Excellent. you know, and if he, if he hits one or two in those six minutes, keeps the Hawks honest. And, and I think might open the floor up for Randall. And maybe get Randall in rhythm a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And then I stick with the same rotations pretty much throughout. The only other thing I would really give a look at 
is maybe throwing them the small look again. And maybe it's yeah. with top in that center and playing alongside Randall, or maybe it's where I, and it all depends on Noel's health, obviously too. Right. I would maybe pull Taj and Noel throw a little bit of a different look, get maybe OB two or three extra minutes and, uh, or maybe throw Randall at center just to give him a different look. But that, that closing lineup, I mean, I think really, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's Rose Bullock, uh, Burks, Randall, yeah. and I guess Taj at this Taj. point, or whatever center's kind of got the hot hand. I would like to see RJ in crunch time. He deserves yeah. it, but I don't know. I, I don't know. The, it's just work. That crunch time five right there has worked. So yeah. I mean, I, it's it's hard to it's hard to blame Tibbs for not playing him because I feel like Burks is so important just from a shot creator, a guy that can get to the line. You know, that's one thing we we don't get to the rim and get to the free throw line. You know, no. and I think Burks does that and Rose does that. So you have to finish with those two guys in the lineup. And then Bullock and RJ, Bullock. It, you know, who do you trust to defend more? Who do you trust to knock down the open three more? You know, I can't, I can't knock Tibbs for making that adjustment. Even though I want to see RJ out there, I just, I want to get the W. Man. Yeah. And I guess Bullock, even if, and I would say maybe if Bullock, you could kind of tell usually early if Bullock's like, feeling yeah. it or not yeah. although he didn't really do anything in game two and then exploded those Fourth threes quarter. were Three. yeah huge big. so big. i guess i would again i i i i guess i would continue to go with bullock uh down the stretch because spacing for us is always something that we're going to struggle with yeah even though we've shot the three balls so well this year i think still the book out on us is like you know certain guys you just don't have to close out on Bullock, even if he's off, you have to close out on Bullock. 100%. And you do have to close out on RJ, too. But I guess Bullock maybe is a little more of a panic if you think he's open. Yeah. So yeah. I, would, I would stick with that. I like the uh, I like the small ball lineup idea because once Capella comes out that game, the whole thing's blown wide open. Right. Like, Danilo's not guarding anybody. They right. try to throw a Congo out there as an adjustment in game two. He really Didn't wasn't work. effective. I mean, once Capella's out the game, we can go full cylinder, small ball, and and really just attack them because they have nobody to defend us. And um, so I would go there. How about this adjustment though? We're not working Trey Young enough on I a agree. defensive end. I'm not sure if you saw that tweet from Tommy Beer, but he I said did. that we only, only shot 12, 12 or something, field right? goal yeah. attempts against Trey Young. Bullock had five, and then IQ Burks and RJ had two. That's that's too little, man. We we're not making this kid work on both ends of the floor enough. And I think that's a huge adjustment we got to make going well, forward. Right. But let's talk that out for a second, right? So you could easily say if Peyton starts again, that's on Peyton because they're going to put right. Trey on Peyton, right? To start the game. That's probably the smartest. Well, well method, see, game right? one, they had him on Bullock. To so start? they were trying to hide him a little bit to start. Yeah. Right. I guess I, I, I guess you can't really put him on Peyton because Peyton's just so much bigger that right. that'll actually allow Peyton to get off. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to effectively space the floor while also yeah. being a, cause they're just going to put Trey on whoever the, you know, the Bullock, or I guess for that lineup, you have to, to test Trey. You have to kind of go with the RJ yeah. kind of lineup. That would be more pressure on the D, but that's a lot less shooting. So it doesn't, I saw the Tommy tweet. It doesn't bother me as much because mm -hmm. What we got from Bullock on defense and shooting wise was so much more valuable than just like, like, let's be honest, Trey's probably not going to get tired from defending. Yeah. He just maybe could crack his confidence a little bit if RJ scores nine on him. So <laughs> I don't really know how to effectively do that. Like, you're not going to run anything with Reggie Bullock, right? To try yeah. to get to the hole. I would, I would, I would see, I would have, I would have Rose, Burks, and RJ. Rose, he, he almost Burks, can't play in that. Well, yeah, then, yeah. then he, yeah, I mean, and then Shoot. if you have Randall Gibson, you throw some screens, maybe they switch, you know, maybe you catch him on the switch or catch him on the switch on RJ in the post, which RJ did execute that on. I think there, there's some lineup, you know, combinations that you may I like that combo. Back. And if Randall is confidently shooting the three and even Rose, it doesn't take a lot of them has been hitting, then yeah. you still probably have enough spacing with Burks in that mix to, to, yeah, you know what? That might be a good, the problem is, is that, you know, the way the rotations kind of go, you'd have to go to that early or in the third because yeah. then Trey gets that long break in the fourth. And are you going with that with four minutes to go? Maybe. Yeah, I might. I might, man. So that's, the, that's, the, that's I guess, the argument for the RJ lineup over the yeah. Bullock lineup. Yeah, yeah. And Maybe it's going to be interesting because 
with McMillan, as you said, Trey, both games, he didn't come back into the fourth until about seven, eight minutes left. McMillan trusts his bench. Maybe he lost a little confidence after game two, but he trusts his bench maybe more than any other coach in basketball. And they're good. They're They're so deep. I get it. They're good, man. But to hold that team to 92 points in the second game, I thought that was a hell of a defensive effort by the Knicks. I'm st- I still feel like with that much firepower that they have, they're going to explode in one of these games. I just feel like it's going to happen. The question is, will the Knicks be able to mount enough offense to, to keep it up? But with, you know, the three-point potential of Trey, Bogdanovich, Herter, you know, uh, uh, Lou Williams off the bench, Gallinari, you know, Collins can hit him. Collins just got into foul trouble early yeah. in the game, too, so he took himself out of the game. They're just so lethal, man. They're Not let I gotta say, um, too. I think this was both Bullock and Burks had some beautiful defensive possessions on Lou Will, who yeah. we all know is maybe one of the original kind of drawing the foul off the bump while going left, but trying to fade so right. Easy. Like he's so, so crafty. Yeah. Quite a few times. They also didn't fall for that 2K crab dribble that all these players where they just hit the brakes. Like yeah. Trey gets everyone like that. Lou will usually too. Mm-hmm. But quite a few times, Burks and Bullock, like really almost jumped like backwards to contest because they know Lou Will's going to try to find that contact. So I thought they were really smart yeah. there. And they look, they were leaving Gallo open and Gallo yeah, kind of shot them out of it. And yeah. I'm not saying that's something I'm fully comfortable with, but you got to live with something. Live with you it. said it, they have too much firepower. You're not going to be yeah. able to cover everyone, you know, on a time in a timely way. So, uh, yeah, but I don't know. I, for me, if I was a betting man, which I've been known to be, I think Randall will play better on the road. Me too. Me too. I think maybe, uh, not being such a jarring going from 2000, 3000 fans to 15, 18 screaming maniacs just ready yeah, to go. Yeah. Maybe you'll actually like settle them down a little bit. So we'll see. Yeah, I agree, man. I think Julius will start to play a bit better now that he's seen two games worth of how the Hawks want to attack him. I think there's some adjustments to be made there. And I just think nerves wise, just getting into the series. You know, this was his first playoff series as well. Uh, and so I think he, he'll he'll settle down. Um, Danilo looks like he's sporting the taxi driver look, man, with De Niro, man. That, He's look, I'm all for playoff mojo stuff. Like you, you, you know, we're talking about you know Xavier McDaniel earlier. It's like Mason was the all time. I mean, Mason Facts. did it better than anybody uh, to this day. But that I don't know. It, I I thought it's a big miss. I thought yeah, he, big <laughs> whatever his playoff look is. is he, by the way, he's good looking dude looks fine, big guy. But just I don't. I just didn't. It's a lot. Big it's miss for lot. the rooster, man. I don't know what he was doing, but that was my guy when he was here, man. I was a big Danilo fan. Oh, same. You know, same. it's hard to lose him in the mellow trade, but you had to do what you had to do. Uh, but shout out to Danilo. So how do you think uh, game three and four, how do, how do you think they go? What's your predictions for three and four? Look, obviously I want to win both, but I would be just thrilled with a split. I think that, yeah. you know, and I think that's all you could ever really do. And the Hawks got their split in New York. So, mm-hmm. uh, I've always said from the beginning, I th- and obviously I'm picking the Knicks because I'm always picking the Knicks, but I, I do think it's a seven-game series. Me too. I think these teams are so closely, evenly matched, but they in a different way. They do different things, and they're both yeah. so young. I think we have the vet advantage. I mean, their vets are really at this point, what, like Lou Will and Gallo and yeah. Capella, right? So they got some guys with some playoff experience. You know, the Taj and D Rose of it all, uh, I think is is huge for us huge. too. I go with the better defensive team yeah. in the playoffs. I think with two young teams, I give the slight edge to defense. So I I still got the Knicks in seven. I think we get the split. Yeah. I think we get the split we need. And I do think it's gonna be tonight. I think Randall goes off tonight. And um I, I think it's tonight, but I don't think the Hawks by any stretch are done. And I do think ATL is going to be wild tonight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously we're all making the like, well, is it still, is it quiet in here? Still Trey? Like, look, <laughs> it ain't going to be the garden, but, and I know New York fan, we travel well, travel so well, we'll man. Have people there, Yeah. but I expect, um, I expect the Hawks to shoot better, especially guys like DeAndre Hunter at home. Right late right. in the game than when they're in what you were at on game two yeah. in New York, yeah. you know? True, true story, man. I'm going for the split as well. Um, I think he's going to go seven. I predicted Nixon seven. I thought that the bench is going to be, you know, the deciding factor in the series. You no, know, our bench scored over 64 points game one, 50 something points game two. Our bench has been electric. Uh, McMillan has been really campaigning for some calls here, man. I mean, a guy that played for the Seattle Supersonics with the glove and, 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 the Rain Man in the 90s, the heyday of the 90s. 
I mean, what is up with this Charmin tissue saw? Now they're complaining that the screens are too hard. Don't you even know, get first me started. It was, first it was the league wants the Knicks to win. Now the Don't even get me hard. started. I counted. On, I watched the second half twice that night, right? Well, I couldn't go to sleep after. Yeah. Once all the kids were asleep, I'm like, you know what? Let me watch the second half again. And I, I tweeted a few things. It was like, we were down 12 with four minutes to go, and the Hawks had the ball. And that's the turnaround was great from here. Yeah. And I counted about three, I'm not going to say illegal screens because it's the playoffs, but three clear outs by Capella on mm -hmm. Trey Young and mm -hmm. Bogdanovich drives where he just literally turned his back with his arms out and just yeah. blocked out the help defender. Yeah. And yeah. it's a savvy move. It's a foul. Right. But in the playoffs, certain things go. So, look, I give Nate McGillan credit, right? Like he complained that about certain things game one. And I thought the game was officiated really well in game one until we started getting the ticky tack BS. Yeah. yeah out of nowhere like i don't mind as long as it's all consistent right, right? just don't change the style in the fourth quarter yeah. and now he's talking about illegal pit like look capella is right up there with league leaders with with sketchy picks so yeah, yeah. You know, call it both ways or don't pick a side and just let him play i'd yeah. rather them don't call the subtle smart ones like capella was doing right yeah, I, I agree with you, man. It's been absolutely ridiculous. And I agree. I thought the officiating was consistent until the fourth quarter where they're just giving Trey Young everything. So let's see what happens when we're in Atlanta now and see how they call it as as uh, as we close out the game. Um, I saw the first take appearance with, with uh, Stephen A. and Max Kellerman. What's up with this guy, Max Kellerman, man? Every week I go on his show and have to school him about these Knicks. And he, he's going back in the past. They threw out Oakley. Dolan this, Dolan that. I'm like, Max, what does that have to do with the here and now and what this team is doing, playing with house money, going into the season? What, what is going on with it, man? Yeah, I don't, I don't fully understand the, the, the takes because, first of all, I love Max. I've been, yeah. you know, I lived in LA almost 20 years. So I, I was listening to Max when he was doing LA, you know, drive time radio. Yeah. And that was his kind of his point on first take yesterday. He's like, when I moved to LA to do drive time radio, I called it quits with the Knicks because of Dolan and because of this. it's like, all right, a couple of things there. You, you called it quits, but also the team was bad and you took a dope right. job in LA and you knew you were going to have to be watching Lakers, Clippers, Dodgers. Right. So like, yeah, I get it. You maybe won't have as much time to watch Nick games and it's a bad product at that point. So yeah. it was a business decision. But now saying that, oh, like, whoa, the Nick fans are like just thrilled to be a force. Listen, that's what I had to say to him on first take. We are going nuts because we were, let me do the math, six, 12, 18 minutes away from being down 2-0 in the first right. round. That's right. So that's why we're so fired up. And yeah, when every single media company and analyst and smart basketball person is saying mm -hmm. 25 wins tops for the Knicks yeah. to basically almost double that yeah. and be a four seed and have all our draft picks and have Dallas draft picks mm -hmm. and have rookies on our team when rookie contracts. Yeah. Yes. We are very thrilled to be have where to be. we are. Yeah. Have to be, have to be. This is house money, man. This is house money. And I just feel like, you know, whether it's the Nets or the Lakers, when you bandwagon, you lose all of the pain, you know, the pain is worth it. The pain is worth it. Obviously we're not winning the chip this year. Right. And, and we got a long ways to go to get there. But just seeing the reaction to winning game two of the first round, we stopped traffic on 7th Avenue. If we ever win a championship, it's going to be state of emergency. But it's because of all the pain that you've endured yeah. before that. You know, that's what the Cub fan ha had gone through, the Eagles fan, the Red Sox fan. Those aren't even my teams. But look, you know, those fans, when they finally did it, it means more. You know, Max rooting for the Lakers now. What does that mean when they won the championship for him last year? I asked him that uh, on his show. Like, what does that really mean? Right. You know, it's meaningless. And look, I don't think there's a path to a championship that doesn't go this way if you're the Knicks, right. unless you go sign Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. You yeah. could skip that step of, okay, we have to go lose in the second round the Philly mm -hmm. and get dominated to get to a championship path. Those are the scars that you need. Yeah. When it's kind of like a homegrown team, you could skip that step. If you sign LeBron, if you sign Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Kawhi yeah. Leonard, although they're having their own problems out there yeah. in LA. Right. So yeah. yeah, you could skip that step of being like, uh, all right. Yeah. You made it to the second round. Great. 
Uh, and the other thing, and I've said this many times, this might sound like bitterness, but I truly mean this from the bottom of my heart. It is not. I would have been thrilled if the Knicks got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving yeah, because we would have skipped a whole bunch of steps and we would have been a championship caliber team. You get those two guys, although they had to go out and get a third Hall of Famer to then be uh, a championship contender. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been great. Me personally, as a fan, and we're talking about Nick fans right now, this is a more enjoyable experience yeah, because sure. Julius Randle came here as a good player and became a great player. Mm -hmm. RJ mm -hmm. is homegrown. I know, I mean, meaning like our draft pick, yeah. quick top in you know we had smart signings but we bring rose back to the knicks he was a nick a few years ago like mm -hmm. this is much more of a kind of grassroots campaign and the fact that we are the four seed i think we're ahead of schedule yeah, yeah. so i enjoy this more man i went through this with the yankees in the 90s before i never enjoyed when the yankees would go sign john for 30 million and like and, yeah. and even stanton yeah. stanton's a great player like Give me the Jeter, Mariano, Pettit, Posada. Yeah. And I, those things don't happen, but what, once every decade or two? True. True. You might have to wait 20 years to get that experience again. And we have waited about 20 years. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm with it, man. I'm with this. The storylines are just better, man. It, it's a redemption story for Tibbs. You know, all the knocks that he's gotten, you know, as a coach and running place to the ground and not having relationships with the young guys. You got 15 guys ready to run through a wall for him. I'm looking at the game. I'm looking at the bench. You know, Pinson is out on the court with Tibbs, you know, in lockstep, coaching all these guys out there. The guy hasn't played one minute of, of meaningful basketball. Uh, like I said, redemption story for Randall, for Derrick Rose. I think RJ could be in this town, you know, maybe not the rings, but like the next, like Mattingly or the, like the next yeah. star that New York really rallies around that. He may not turn into a superstar, but mentally, you know, he has that, toughness to to really you know represent the city well i think rj is going to be that guy for us yeah like look i i don't know how you draft for this right like it's a tricky thing i i, I think and obviously i was even following the whole uh you know matt barnes stephen jackson yeah, Kwame Brown stuff, yeah, right and yeah. like bus talk and all that and like yeah. I, I get like all sides of it like Kwame brown's not a bust in like life measures like he he made it 50 times over but how do you draft that guy that you know wants to be great not only as a player but within the team context of winning mm -hmm. i don't know because even like look this is a terrible comparison i'm about to make terrible mm -hmm. but i i do some scouting stuff for like the nba 2k league right with the mm -hmm. knicks and even with that all the, these are young young some of these i call them kids i'm because i'm old some of these mm -hmm. young men and women are 18 years old and they are yeah, yeah. so savvy about like what to say, how to say it, all the right answers. And sometimes once they get into the league, they do quite the opposite of what they say. I remember these meetings and they do quite the opposite of what they said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I, that's probably the hardest part of drafting is like, who's that guy that wants to be great, not only individually, but as a winner. And yeah. RJ is that guy. He's that guy. He, yeah. I'm not comparing him to Kobe Bryant, but it seems like he has that desire. Like he seems like the dude on Friday night. He's like, are right, you guys are going to the club? I'm gonna go get these shots up. Yeah, like he yeah. seems like that kind of guy. And Randall is that kind of guy. We've read yeah. every article on that. So uh, that, that makes me very, very optimistic about sure. the future. Cause he's also, is he 21? Yeah. I don't even think he's 21 yet. I don't he's think he's 21 up. yet. I think yeah. it's like next week or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I'm also, I, I like the fact that uh, I said this on, on, on many, many times we hide these guys. I feel like with Rose and, and, uh, and Worldwide West, them having the relationship with these prospects at a very young age when they were on the agency side, I feel like they have a leg up on the rest because they know these kids. And, you know, they know all these kids coming up through these future draft classes and what they're about. Obviously, the ones that go through Kentucky, they have an even more special relationship with and ultimately who gets funneled through CAA. But I just feel like we have a leg up with those guys in terms of the relationships that they formed with a lot of these prospects come to come. Here's why that's super smart, right? What you just said, and you got me thinking like, huh, wow, I didn't even think of it that way. I, I, I thought about it for what you're saying, but now I'm thinking about it in a whole other way. Like, do you know two young guys who weren't scared of anything in games one and two is quickly yeah. in Toppin, right? And Toppin for everyone in every, you know, 
sports personality year one's already throwing the bust word around with Toppin, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Cause yeah. nowadays, like if you're not, if you get drafted in the lottery, if you're not an instant star, you're a bust. That's how quickly the turnover rate, the rate is. But no one was saying the name Emmanuel quickly True. in the draft. Like some True. people had us targeting him, maybe even second round or whatever, or late mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And one thing you say quickly was great in game one. Game two, that dude was so – he was throwing up air balls because you could see <laughs> the adrenaline. Yeah. It was almost like a boxer where you got to be like, yo, you got – this is a 12-round fight. Take a mm -hmm. deep breath. You're mm -hmm. Like, he was so amped up, but he is unafraid. Yeah. And I don't think that dude's going into Atlanta tonight afraid of anything. And yeah. I don't know how you draft that, like, because these guys are so savvy at saying the right thing. But I think we found – two or three young players who just aren't afraid and want to be great. Yeah, man. De definitely looking forward to uh, what they can bring in the future. But tonight, Sunday, we got to get a win, Jerry, man. I, I definitely appreciate all the time you gave today. Next one, we got to get you on a post game once I get back in New York. And, you know, you have some time in your schedule. I know it's very busy for you, man. We definitely got to get you on a post game and hear from the callers live and direct, man. But for today, I definitely appreciate the time. This was, this was a great conversation, man. For sure, man. And uh, yeah, I would say the nights get a little tough with the two kids. But yeah. as far as post game, I, I think maybe after game five, we know there's a game okay. five. when you're back in New York. Um, yeah, if I just get the only thing is like I, I could commit. You just got to be OK with the last minute canceling. Yeah, that's, that's, that's out okay. of my control sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I would never normally cancel on anybody last minute. But if this house goes upside down, I'm like, yeah. ah. I'm the, understandable, take, man. We're, we're flexible, man. No worries. No I would worries. love to take some calls and talk to Nick fans all day. I mean, this is what I've been doing all day anyway. <laughs> all right. No doubt, man. Thanks again. Enjoy the game. Enjoy the weekend. I'll hit you up on Twitter, man. We'll, we'll talk during this game. Yes. Hopefully we get a W, bro. Thanks a lot. Please do.